a really important aspect of doing debugging is the ability to set uh, breakpoints. Uh, breakpoint, as it says here, makes your program stop whenever a certain point in the program is reached. Uh, and for each breakpoint, you can also actually add conditions to say only break under the following circumstances. So if you're going, if you're debugging a loop that's counting down from a thousand to zero and you only want to break when it gets down to one, you can actually ask GDB to only stop when that condition is met. You're welcome to read about that uh, as we go, but we're, I'm not going to really demonstrate that here. But we've already uh, we've already shown how to set a breakpoint uh, when we back out again, start fresh. We demonstrated how to set a breakpoint previously when I said break main. I know that there's a function called main that's the initial function going to be executed, and so this adds that breakpoint at main. And then if I run it it's going to stop right away at that breakpoint. And note that because I set a real breakpoint and not a temporary one, it doesn't say temporary anymore. It gives me this information that says, yes, you actually have this breakpoint out there. Uh, important to know here that GDB assigns a number to each breakpoint. And a lot of the commands that work on breakpoints refer to that number. So you can see here it says breakpoint one, uh, that that would be the value that we would use if we want to do some manipulation on that breakpoint. So there's a variety of different ways you can set breakpoints. So the one that we've been that we just did with break main was this sort of generic break location. It tells you that you can set a breakpoint at a given location, which can be the name of a function, which is what we just did. You can break at a specific line number or at the address of an instruction. So let's because we're still in source file land here, let's take a look at this. Uh, we'll list out some code here. Let's set a breakpoint to stop right here before we check to see if there was uh, if there was only just the command uh, name being passed into the to the C program. So I'm going to just say break 45. That's the line number. Now I've got breakpoint two at bomb.c line 45, and there's the address of the uh, of the instruction that corresponds to that that command. Now if I hit, uh, if I tell the, the program, or let, tell GDB to let the program continue to execute, which I can do with the continue command, we'll come back to that a little bit later, it says continuing, and now it says breakpoint two. So now it's stopped at this location right here. So again, we can set breakpoints either by the name of the function, as we did initially, or by the name, or by the line of the source line that we want to break at. Let's see. Yeah, and the the breakpoint causes your program to stop just before it executes the code that you've uh, that you've identified the, for the location of your breakpoint. So the breakpoint uh, prevents the code that you're breaking at from starting execution, which is exactly what you want. You can also set a breakpoint just at your current. Uh, execution point. So without any arguments, break sets a breakpoint at the instruction to be executed. Uh, let me, we'll come back to that after we talk about how to step through uh, instructions. Uh, let's see. We can get a list of our breakpoints with, again, info tells us about our program. And here we're looking for breakpoint information. And we get some information back from GDB. So there's two breakpoints that we've set so far, one at line 37, one at line 45. There's those numbers that you're going to use. It tells us what type it already is. It says whether uh, it's going to be kept around or whether it's a temporary one. It tells us whether or not the breakpoint is enabled or not, and what address it's actually being asked to break at. So the assembly language location at that address is where we're breaking. This enabled flag is, uh, we can actually enable or disable breakpoints. So you can, and we'll talk about that in a second here. Okay, so that's a table of all of our breakpoints. We can clear out the breakpoints. So I can delete any breakpoints uh, at the next instruction uh, if I just say clear with no arguments. If I want to clear a specific breakpoint, I can give it a location uh, number. So if I wanted to say clear <coughs> main, it says it's deleted breakpoint one. That's a little bit confusing, <coughs> except that we know that breakpoint one was the one that we had set at the beginning of main. So now if I do an info breakpoints, I'll see that there's only breakpoint number two left. 
Notice what I did there. Uh, the GDB uses the same read line library that the bash shell does. So all of your command history stuff is in play inside of GDB. So I just did control P to back up a few a few lines, but all the same completion and, and history functions are available to you inside of GDB. Okay. We can also use the delete command to, to delete by number instead of location. Okay, here's what I was getting at before, the notion that we can enable or disable breakpoints. So we've just seen that we can add breakpoints and we can delete them entirely. But if you want to have a breakpoint that you want to keep around for some reason, like you've got a, uh, a loop that you're trying to debug and you've got a breakpoint in that loop, uh, that, that you're going to maybe reuse in the future after you debug somewhere else and you don't want to have to go back in and reset the breakpoint, you can just disable it temporarily. So I can say disable and breakpoint2. And now if I do info breakpoints again, you can see that the enabled column here says that it's not enabled. That basically means that this breakpoint won't do anything. It's not active right now. So even if the processor starts to execute this instruction in memory, it'll just let the let the instruction go. But at some later point, I can say enable breakpoint two, and then look at the info, and now it's back to being uh, enabled again. You can uh, save your breakpoints to a file if you've got a bunch of them set and the prospect of having to set them all over again manually is uh, distasteful. You can say save breakpoints and then give it a file name like foo breakpoints.txt. And uh, well, let's go look and see what's in that file. As I've said before, you can run shell commands by just prefixing them with an exclamation point. So I can cat out foo bp.txt. Notice it even gives you command line completion. Uh, and it tells us, or that's so that's the contents of the file. It's a breakpoint and it's being asserted at that particular location in bomb.c line 45. <coughs> Okay, I mentioned before that can that once we've stopped our execution with a breakpoint, we may well want to be able to continue it. And there's really two ways of doing that. One, I've already demonstrated this notion of the continue command. Uh, let me just, I'll start again here and remind you what that was. So start my, start my GDB and I'm gonna put a, uh, again, we we're, I was setting a breakpoint, um, manually at line 45 here, just before this argc equals one. So I'm gonna put a break at main as we did before. And then I'm also gonna put a break at line 45. So info breakpoints, got those two breakpoints again. You'll notice that because neither of these breakpoints have been hit yet, uh, that we just get the simple list of breakpoints. So now I'm gonna say run, and it's gonna stop at breakpoint number one, which is at the beginning of main info breakpoints again. Now it tells us that this breakpoint has already been hit one time. So it actually tracks the number of times a breakpoint's been hit. Uh, and you can actually use that to set conditional breakpoints that will trigger after a certain number of hits or stop after a certain number of hits. But what we're illustrating right here is the continue command, which you can also just abbreviate C, I think. And that says, just start running normally. Now, if I didn't have any other breakpoints in place, it would just execute the rest of the program, which would cause the bomb to blow up at this point, if I don't want that. Um, but in this case, it's going to execute until it hits the next breakpoint, which is breakpoint number two at bomb.c line 45. And then if I do info again, you can see that it's indicated that that second breakpoint has been hit. Okay, so the continue command just lets your program go. And if there happen to be breakpoints coming up or other nefarious reasons that your program might stop, it will it will encounter those just as part of its normal execution. What we're often interested in doing though is single stepping through the code. So the command that the main one of the commands that we do that with is called step. So <clears throat> continue running your program until control reaches a different source line. 
So let's see what that what that means. Let me stop again, and then I'm gonna clear out and start running. <coughs> I'll just do list, so we can see that uh, we can get to the uh, to the main function, and then I'm gonna demonstrate this ability to single step inside of that function. So we could either say break main and then do a run, but we have that kind of convenient shortcut where we can say start, and that will set that temporary breakpoint and run the program up to the beginning of main and then pause for me. So if I say list from here, it's showing me that I'm actually at line 37. You can see that uh, when you do a list, it will show you the lines before and after the line that you're currently waiting on. Uh, and we'll see that there's other ways to kind of show that a little bit more clearly uh, in a second. But what I want to show right now is this ability to step forward. So step, again, run the program until control reaches a different source line, and then stop and return control to GDB. So if I say step, you can see that it's actually gone through uh, and executed until this next source line. Well, that seems like it went quite a long ways down. Let's do another list. You can see that between the beginning of main here at line 37, there's no executable code. There's a declaration here, but the next executable code is actually this if statement at line 45. So that's where the execution stops. Now I can say step again and see what happens. Well, Apparently argc actually was equal to 1, which makes sense, right? Because when I did the run command, I didn't give it any additional arguments, which means that argc would just contain the name of the program file. So it will have a count of one string in the, in the argv array. So stepping forward gets me to that statement. I mentioned before that if you just hit return, in other words, give a blank line as a command, it'll repeat your last command. I've been doing that with list, but let's see how it works with step as well. So if I just hit return, I go to line 67. Well, let's see what was going on between line 49 and line 67. So <clears throat> that doesn't show me everything I need to see. So let's just do a list and we'll mention specific lines. Let's look at lines 30 through 70. So I was up here, in file equals standard in, and that was the end of the if statement. Then there's an else clause, or an else if, then an else if, and finally the next executable statement is here at line 67, this initialize bomb function. So you can see that that was the next source line that would that should have been executed because I've already entered this if clause, that would cause me to skip this one and skip this one, so I end up here at line 67. Okay, so step just goes to, the, to a different source line. There's also a command called next, and what it does is it continues the next source line in the current stack frame. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, we're stopped at line 67 here, which is about to call a function. Um, if I just did a step here, I would find myself stepping into the code for initialize bomb. Because step just says run until the next source line. And the next source line could be inside of initialize bomb. In some cases, I do want to descend into those function calls to see what's happening inside the function. In other cases, if I'm quite sure that that function is already working properly or I'm not interested in seeing it, its behavior in detail at this point, I can also say, go ahead and execute that function call and everything that it does, and then only stop when I come back from that function call, which would mean I'd want to run this function and break on this line, this printf. And that's the difference here. Uh, that notice that that printf is in the same stack frame, basically the same level of, of nesting function calls as initialize bomb. So while step will go to the next source line, which might be inside of initialize bomb, next will go to the next source line in the same stack frame, which is going to be this one. So that's the distinction. You could, you could also, a simple way of say, saying that would just be to say step just runs every single instruction, every single source line. Whereas next does the same thing, except it doesn't step into function executions. So let's, uh, let's do a step, see what happens. 
Well, it ended up going to line 69, which is the next thing in the same stack frame. Now, why would that be the case? Turns out, again, these step commands refer to source lines, right? So it's the next source line, the next, or a different source line in the same stack frame. Because the only thing in the bomb that's compiled with source code debugging information included, as far as GDB is aware, this is the only source code that it knows about. So it, although it did in fact go and execute code inside of initialized bomb, it did not find any source code there. There wasn't any information about the source, the sources of that code. So it just executes that code and comes back to us. And the first source line that it encounters is right here. So you can see that the point here is that step and next only operate on source code. And if there is no source code information included in the executable, because we didn't turn on that G flag, uh, there's no source code for it to stop at, and it will just continue to execute until it finds some source line that, that it has information about. We'll see that there's another set of commands that allow us to execute individual instructions at the assembly level as well, and that always works as we've just described it. Another command that you can make use of when you're single stepping in source code is this command called finish. This will continue running until the function you're in returns. This is especially helpful if you've accidentally uh, stepped into a function instead of nexting over it, because it will just run the function you're currently in to it till it returns to its caller. In other words, it goes to the previous stack frame, and then it prints out a return value and leaves you at the pos at the point where the function returned. Okay. In order to single step through the assembly language in our program, we need to use different instructions. So step and next and finish all are oriented towards source code. And if there isn't any source code information available to the debugger, that's not gonna work so well. Instead, what we wanna do is use the step I and next I, which stands for step instruction and next instruction. And these are analogous to step and next, except they operate at the assembly language level. So let's go back to our code here. I'm going to exit out of there. Oops. Shoot. <laughs> Didn't really want to go that far out. Um. Notice what I'm doing here when I run the command. I'm uh, Because I want to just sort of start with a clean, clean slate each time I run GDB. I've uh, included clear, which clears the terminal. And then I've used ampersand ampersand, which is a shell construct that says, if this thing worked properly, in other words, if it returned a value of zero, then do this thing. It's sort of like the short circuit operators in C. Uh, you can also just put a semicolon between commands on the same command line, but that's going to always execute the next command, even if the first one didn't work. So I generally use double ampersands. OK, so I'm going to do start again to fire this guy up. We're now stopped at main. If I list it out again, we can see that that's where we are. Now what I'm going to type instead of typing step is step i. Well, it looks a lot like we just went to the next source instruction. Um, well, let's try again. Again, I'm just hitting return to run this same instruction. And now it's telling me that I'm at a particular address in memory and executing line 45. Another step in file equals standard in. It's like I'm bouncing back and forth between source code and uh, indications of where I am in memory. I'm not actually seeing the assembly instructions that I'm that I'm executing. So there's a couple of different ways that we can get around that problem. One is that we can use a command called display. Display uh, allows us to say whenever GDB stops execution, in other words where it stops at a breakpoint, I want you to display the following values. So we can kind of keep track of some piece of information that we want to be regularly aware of as we're going through the through the debugging. One of the things that we can look at is the contents of the program counter. And we'll see in a minute that there's other abbreviations for different machine registers, but that's how you say program counter. Um, we don't want to just look at the program counter's value, however. We want to look at the actual instruction that's there. 
and we can ask the display command to disassemble that one instruction by giving it a, a format of instruction. So the slash i tells it format what you find at the program counter as an instruction. Well, now because that was actually a command, uh, we see the output that we get when we're using display. So it's showing us the address, and then here's the actual command that, or the actual assembly instruction that's about to be executed. Now if we step some more, we'll see that, well, now we're about to do a jump queue to a new location. Step again. Now we're, we're at that new location, right? Here's where we were about to jump to, and now here's where we are. And then we're about to call a function at uh, 5D04. Step again. Well, step steps into uh, functions just like step, sorry, step I steps into functions just like step does. So we've now called a function at 5D04, and we're at 5D04, which is the beginning of the initialized bomb function. And you can see that it's about to do a push RBP. That's probably to store the RBP register so that it can make use of it for its own purposes. Step again. Now it's pushing RBX. Again, stacking stuff that it wants to be able to keep track of while it's executing. Uh, now it's making room for itself on the stack by subtracting this constant from the stack pointer, uh, where it's going to store local variables and the like, and so forth. Uh, so that's one way we can look at the disassembled uh, instructions. That's a little clunky in a way, uh, because you're seeing the, the command that's actually being executed, this display information. Uh, so we can, we can turn off that display and let's look at another, another way of doing this. So to turn off dis a display, you can say, well, undisplay, and then you give it the name of the uh, display command you want to turn off. If you say undisplay with no arguments, it'll say, do you want to get rid of all the auto display stuff? Well, no. Let's actually ask for it explicitly. And then if we say display again, well, now there's nothing to display because we've turned that off. So if we continue to single step without that display on, now we're kind of back to where we were. We're seeing things in terms of the, uh, the, the source code, but not really looking at the assembly instructions. We can also turn on a mode where it does that automatically. So I can say set, and it's disassemble something. I'm going to use some tab completion here. Disassemble next line. And this is uh, the set command is the command that we use to tell GDB how, to, how we want it to be configured. And mo a lot of these are just true false values. So this is one of those. So you can say disassemble next line on or one or true, and those will all turn it on. I'm going to use on, oin, on. And you can check the value of those variables by saying show. So remember that info tells us about our program, but show tells us about GDB itself. So show disassemble next line on tells us debugger's willingness, wow, to use disassemble next line is on. Okay, so now if we do a step I, we'll see disassembler output. Now this is a little bit more extensive actually than what we get when we interpret just the instruction as, or interpret the program counter as an instruction. We get the address, we get an offset from the most recent symbol, we get the binary dump of the, of the instruction itself as well as a disassembly of it. So it's a little bit more extensive um, and it's just kind of automatically turned on uh, when we do that disassemble next line on. Step I, so we can just continue to step through here and see what's going on. I'm going to stop this and start up a fresh session again. Uh, start. And then here's another uh, way you can you can do this. Uh, GDB has what's called the TUI, which is short for Text User Interface, which means it's based on the Curses library and just uses your terminal to display additional information in a kind of a windowed format. It's pretty primitive, but it's, as you'll see, quite a lot more helpful than just looking things at things a line at a time. So to turn that on, you can say layout, and I'm gonna, there's several of these, but I'm gonna say layout assembly, and boom, we get another window that gives us direct information about not only where we are, but what's coming up. So this is a super helpful display to use. Uh, it tells us our process ID, which function we're in, what line within the file, and then it also tells us our program counter uh, here on this status line. 
And now if I do step I, you can see up above that we're now stepping through the instructions. So now it's about, it's at a jump equal to 573C. Well, now we're there at 57C3, and then we're uh, moving information around. So you can follow, there's the jump instruction we looked at before to main plus 54. There we are at main plus 54. Now we're about to call initialize bomb. Hit step again. There's initialize bomb and that the push operations that we just saw previously and the subtraction to allocate space on the stack frame for that function. So this is probably the most comprehensible way to look at the contents of your uh, assembly code as you're stepping through it. Let me bail out of this again. I want to just show you that there's also um, a version of this that lets you look at source code if you have access to it, which um, the only place you have is bomb.c in this case, but in normal development you'd be able to turn on debugging for everything. So I'm going to start and then I'm going to do layout source. And now you can see the source code and as you, now I'm going to go back to using this, this step instead of the step i, which is going to step through the source code. Uh, there's a step, there's a step, more steps. Now we're going to go to, and we're going to go into initialize bomb. Um, instead of going into initialize bomb, I'm just going to use next to step over that function call. And now we end up at the printf immediately following initialize bomb. And if I say next, it's going to show me the output that's coming from um, from uh, from the program. It's a little bit messed up here because it's now thinking that it's going to get from get information from standard input, which is bound up to GDB. So we get this kind of weird looking stuff going on. Uh, but if I think if I type something bogus here like foo, uh, yeah, it's it's now confusing. It's it's crossing the streams. Uh, it's confusing the read read from the standard input from the GDB. So that kind of goes haywire at that point. But you can uh, debug from the source files as well. Okay. Let's see. One machine. So yeah, step analogous to step I, but for in machine instructions. Next analogous to next next I analogous to next, but for machine instructions. Um, backtrace. So let's go back here. Start our debugger, and then. Um, Say start and let's break point at that initialize bomb function. And then let's run. Oops, I don't want to start from the beginning. I don't want to run, I want to do continue to let that go. Now you can see that we're at that breakpoint. Now we're just setting a breakpoint at some arbitrary location in the code. We're not entirely sure necessarily how we got there, but the backtrace tells us what's on the call stack to show us how we got to where we are. So we can see that we're currently in stack frame number zero, which is the initialize bomb function. And we can't, we went there from this address in the main function, which happened to be bomb.c line 67. Because we don't have debugging information for the file that contained initialize bomb, we don't get that location information, but we can definitely tell where we are and how we got there. Um, let me turn on assembly output, and let's um, let's do a little. So here's our backtrace again. You can abbreviate to BT. Let's do some stepping here. So I'm going to do step I, step, step, step. Now we're about to do a function call. Okay, we're still in initialize bomb, but. I'm going to now call out to this signal handler, which is part of how the initialization takes place. But what I want to illustrate here is that, so we're now in a new source file. And if I do backtrace again, we'll now see that we're inside of this signal at pult function. But that thing was called from initialize bomb, and that thing was called from main. So again, backtrace allows you to see where you have come from as you're executing the code. And there's a bunch of... Um, flags that you can provide to the backtrace to look at a specific number of frames and those sorts of things, but you can read through that yourself. Okay, 
we've already been looking at how we can examine source files. So I've shown you the ability to list a function, to just list, which is going to list more lines than what we've already seen. Uh, we saw how you can list a line number. I showed you how to list like line one or a range of lines, 10 to 70, I think it was. So that's all available to you to look at source files. Again, for this lab, that's not super helpful because you only have access to that the source code for the bomb.c top level main function. So not super helpful yet, but um, again, good to know about. We've also been talking about um, commands that use locations. So one of those kinds of locations is a line number. So we could set a breakpoint at a line number. Uh, we can print source code at a line number. We can also specify a file name and a line number. So if we go back here, remember that we're see, we see this kinds of output like bomb.c line 67. Uh, we can use that same kind of syntax, for example, to set a breakpoint. If we're currently working in file foo and we want to set a breakpoint at line 17 of file bar, we can still be inside of file foo and say break bar.c colon 17. We can also set breakpoints at a function. So this is how we did the breakpoint at main or the one we just did to do a breakpoint at uh, the initialize bomb function. Let me show you one that's going to be really important for your use in this lab. Um, we want to set a breakpoint at the point at which the bomb blows up. Okay, it's to avoid having the bomb accidentally blow up. Uh, just like we saw before with main and initialize bomb, there's uh, there's an explode bomb function. I'll just give you that as a freebie. Um, and you can see that you get command completion here. I can say break ex and hit tab, and it gives me the options of breaking at exit or at explode bomb, which is what I want to do. Uh, so that's telling me where that where that thing is actually located, but it's it's set a breakpoint there. So if I say info break points tells me that it's got a breakpoint at explode bomb. Now I'm going to just run this guy. I've set no other breakpoints. I'm just going to try to make it explode. So blow yourself up, foo, boom. Except it didn't go boom, right? It stopped at the explode bomb. So this is what you're going to pretty much always want to do is set a breakpoint at that explode bomb location in order to prevent your program from, from going up in smoke if you fail to defuse a bomb. So this will avoid having extra points taken off. Um, of course, at this point, I could say continue, which would let the explode bomb function go, and boom, it blows up, right? So it's not totally safe. <laughs> you got to not fat finger commands like that, but that's the way that you prevent yourself from having your bomb explode. All right. Now, uh, it's also going to be really important for you to be able to examine memory at different locations within your source code. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that. One is the, is the print function. This is a source code oriented approach to this. So if we go back to our code here and let's notice that it didn't ask me if I wanted to kill off my inferior process because it was already dead. Let's start again here and then let's do a list and we've got um, our main file here again. So let me do a start. That'll break us at the beginning of main. And what we want to look at is how this print function works. So this lets us basically specify an expression that we want to have its value printed out. Uh, and this is a this is a source level expression. So the, the debugger knows about source code. Um, let's, for example, uh, we've been seeing that this argc value is in fact equal to 1 the way that we've been running it, but we've only been able to dope that out because we've always seen it take this if and assign the in file to the standard input. Instead, let's, uh, let's actually look at the contents of that variable. So we can say print argc. By golly, it's 1. We could also look at, say, argv, print argv. Right, this is the, the array of strings containing the command line parameters. Well, hmm. Okay, it's an address. You can see that it's an address up in relatively high memory addresses because the stack is allocated way high and this is a local variable. It's a parameter that's been pushed on the stack, so that's expected. It also gives us some information about the type. 
that it's a char star star, which is how it's declared, right? It's a char star. It's an array of char stars, which is a char star star. But that's not super helpful yet. What if we wanted to actually see what was in there? Well, it this the print statement allows us to put in C type expressions and it will evaluate them for us. So it's saying, well, the first thing in argv is itself an array of characters, right? It's a char star and it contains the name of the program that I'm running. To demonstrate the ability to pass additional parameters in, and this isn't really germane to the bomb program, but I'm just going to use it as an example here. I'm going to run the start, well, let's see, let me just do it manually. I'm going to set a break at main, okay, instead of using the start command here. And then I'm going to say run, and then I'm going to say foo bar baz. Okay, so we're now at the beginning of main, and argc and argv have values. So if I do print of argc, now it's got four, because I've given it three command line arguments plus the name of the command. So if I look at argv, well, it's still that goofy double, or this is still that goofy pointer, double pointer. If I look at star argv, well, star argv gives me the first such string. Another way to look at it in C is I could look at argv of zero, okay? But now I can also see argv of one is foo, and argv of two is bar, and argv of three is baz, okay? So again, you can use any kind of a C expression that you want to evaluate in the source code to be able to see what the, what the values are.